Good afternoon and welcome to our live webcast with Ross Martin, Chief Executive of SCDI. I'm Ian Forsyth. And today we're going to be looking at a number of issues across Scotland's economy, things that are going on, the, the sort of hot topics, and get Scott, uh, Ross's take on that. For many people, the outlook's either bleak or it's rosy, we would be better with independence, we would be better as part of the union. All of those topics are bubbling around just now. Um, but before I go over and talk to, to Ross about those things and many other things, just to reiterate for those who weren't in five minutes ago when we did our little welcome, uh, there is a discussion box there. So we do want to hear from you. Get your questions into that discussion box and they'll come through to the screen in front of me and we'll be able to get as many of those as possible over to you. I'm sure you look forward to answering audience questions. Absolutely. The more, the more questions, the better. So if people have got some questions, however tricky, then fire them in and we'll do our best to answer. That almost sounded like an invitation to make them as tricky as possible. Mm. Then, eh? So any, anything you like, you send them through and Ross will be delighted to do what he can to answer them for you. Um, the other thing, I mean, just setting the background here, really, there are a bit of a mixed audience here in terms of we've got a number of people who are already members of SCDI. There's a lot of people who are not members, new to it, may not even know what it is that you do or what it is that you're about. And I was having a look at the website before today and there was a, a, a sentence on there that I think seemed to sum up your reason for existence. So I'm, I'm going to go for that okay. word for word, so I will read that out because I'll never remember it otherwise. Our aim is to influence and inspire government and key stakeholders to create sustainable economic prosperity for Scotland, an ambition as relevant today as it was when SCDI was established in 1931. So tell me Ross, what, what does that mean in practice? Well, SCDI and the membership of SCDI is essentially a snapshot of the Scottish economy at any given time. And if people want to take the temperature of the Scottish economy across private sector, public sector, the social economy sector as well, then asking SCDI membership um, how they are feeling, whether they're feeling positive, whether they are concerned about things, whether they are feeling that investment is coming through um, or not, then the membership is really a reflection of the economy. And at the same time, what we want to do is to shape the economy so it's more robust, more resilient, um, and reflect our membership in the same way. So we evolve as the Scottish economy evolves, and we kind of, it's just kind of through an iterative process um, in order that we maintain that we're as up-to-date um, as the economy is, and the economy is prepared for uh, whatever the global economy is going to throw at it. What evidence is there that you know organisations like SCDI actually do have an impact and, a, and an influence on the economy? Plenty is the answer, the <laughs> short answer to that question, but some examples maybe. Um, if you look back through the ages, um, at any time, any point in, in history, um, then government is influenced by external forces, whether it was um, in the Enlightenment period um, in, in Edinburgh, for example, and, and across the country, um, and all the, the discussion which was going on, which was influencing um, politicians and policy at that stage, or in the first few years of SCDI's um, life. In 1938, SCDI was largely responsible for the creation of Scotland's first industrial park at Hillington, um, and a whole series of interventions mm -hmm. um, which have been made uh, in the economy through uh, the suggestions, the ideas, the innovations which have come from that wider discussion, politicians uh, would recognise uh, that they don't have all the answers and they need to engage with Civic Scotland more widely. Uh, and organisations like SCDI uh, provide a platform for that discussion. And are there other organisations that you can work alongside or are in partnership with with that? Yeah, because SCDI ranges across the whole of the economy, then obviously we are not particularly specialist in some areas, and so we engage with others who are mm -hmm. specialist representing a particular sector, for example. Uh, so there are a whole range of organisations, either representative bodies or, or think tanks or um, organisations which are associations of professional uh, of a professional nature, which we must engage with in order to get that, that depth of knowledge and experience, as well as having that broad strategic view across the economy as a whole. Okay, I mean, I think you know that that sets the scene nicely in terms of what SCDI is about. I think people probably have logged in today to hear some of your thoughts and, and views on the the hot the hot topics, mm. for want of a better descrip yeah. description. The last four or five years have been pretty turbulent for businesses, not just in Scotland, but almost everywhere. 
What do you think are the lessons that we can learn from that? I think there are probably two main lessons in terms of the broad economic profile uh, and what's happened over the past few years. One in terms of public expenditure and the other in terms of private sector investment. Uh, in terms of public expenditure, clearly we've still to see a large um, chunk of the reduction in public expenditure from its very high levels in in 2009-10. And the lessons which have been learned in terms of dealing with that change from a period of growth in public expenditure to a period of restraint um, are still ongoing. You know, doing things in a different way, driving more innovation through public services, for example, um, and reshaping, uh, in particular, the relationship between the public and the private sector mm -hmm. in Scotland. That's an area which has had its troubles in the past, but we're beginning to see now examples of public and private sector working together. And that brings me on to the second point in terms of private investment. It needs to be smarter. It needs to be um, more imaginative in terms of how we identify the use of public sector assets, for example, and use them to drive in private sector investment so that we can look at the economy as a whole and be able to work together um, in order to make the, the Scottish economy more robust and more resilient. Can I just pick up on that, that point you made about the public and private sector working more closely together than there being some examples? Can you give us some of those in tangible terms? Well, one of the uh, huge growth areas at the moment are business improvement districts, which are an opportunity for public sector and private sector to come together to look at how you can add value to existing services or do new things. So there are already 20 business improvement districts around the country. There are another 20 coming down the track. They've been given their grant to, to go to ballot. And there's another 20 in, in initial formation. So all over the country, people are reconnecting themselves and the place in which they live or work. And the business improvement district is an opportunity for the public and the private sector to come together to define local um, responsibilities and local initiatives and to drive the local economy in a way which is going to support the national economy as you put that jigsaw puzzle together. So we've got someone in the audience today saying, thinking business improvement district, that's something I'm not really familiar with. What would your advice be to, to them in terms of either getting something off the ground or, or getting involved with something mm. like that? Well, first and foremost, um, there is government support available mm -hmm. uh, for this particular initiative. And there's an organisation called Bid Scotland, uh, which administers that support. And so uh, if you log on to the Bid Scotland website, then you'll find out all the details about that. But essentially, it's where private sector interests come together within a defined area or sector, and it's not specific to town, town centres, for example, which is where a lot of them have come through in the first flush. Um, but private sector interests decide that they want to take some action themselves um, to work with the public sector at the same time and to drive forward some improvements in terms of their operating environment. And that could be in the, in the whiskey industry, it could be across in, in, in golf when you've got the Ryder mm. Cup coming, so you would expect some uh, movement in that direction. It could be along transport corridors, along waterways, or in town centres or more defined urban uh, geographies. Uh, but the opportunity to bring public and private together um, in a non-controversial way with complete cross-party support, I have to say, mm -hmm. um, at, at both national and at local level, then that creates a stable operating environment for development, stability and growth. Okay. Um, in, in just taking that kind of government bit a little bit further, uh, obviously they must, all governments must have learned lessons in the last four right. or five years. In terms of moving forward, what do you think, and I'm not talking at a political level here, but just governments generally, what do they need to be doing now to make sure that we move forward out of the... the, the the situation we've been in? I think first and foremost the big lesson over the past say two or three decades has been that government needs to set a stable um, regulatory and fiscal framework. Um, we've seen for example in the oil and gas sector a couple of years ago you know a complete unannounced shock introduced by government um, and that created 
you know, a real concern because that wasn't planned for in terms of you know, annual budgets, in terms of forward operating plans, in terms of investment opportunity. And so government needs to be forward thinking. It needs to ensure that people understand what direction of travel it's going in and it needs to create as stable an operating framework as possible uh, in order that the people who can drive the economy at the local, regional and national levels have an understanding of what, uh, what the operating setup is going to be for them so that they can plan, they can invest and they can introduce initiatives which are going to grow their businesses. Okay, I mean, if we, we move into sort of maybe some more specifics in terms of things that, that have happened recently. I'm thinking Grangemouth and, and Govan and the potential impact that, you know, big businesses and the threats to those big businesses have on a whole economy and a, and a community. Um, how can that situation be avoided? Can it be avoided? Absolutely, and, and we can learn lessons from other countries. I mean, I'm not necessarily advocating that we that we import the, the Mittelstand um, set up in Germany where there's so much of the economy is, is developed and driven through uh, small, medium-sized enterprises. Um, there are elements of that which we could certainly learn from. And actually, it takes me back to the answer to the first question mm -hmm. about SCDI, the nature of SCDI and, and, and how we reflect the Scottish economy. I don't think we've got the balance quite right in terms of the economy at the moment. And so we need to ensure that we have more small businesses, we have uh, more social enterprise um, activity, that we have a much more imaginative uh, public sector ready to engage with private sector or social economy. And that we, that we remove some of those barriers, those traditional barriers from people working together. And if we can do that, then I think the balance will sort itself out and we'll be able to develop an economy which is much stronger and more resilient to some of those shocks. But is it not the case that we're very much up against a situation where, and, and quite understandably, uh, you know, anybody who's in government is going to want to have the, the big hits and bring in the big businesses because that's what makes the headlines, whereas a you know, two, three person business is never going to yeah. have that impact. How, how do we get around that? Well, I think that the lesson in Scotland in particular um, and I spent you know, 10 years in, in West Lothian uh, and, and saw the growth and then the decline of, of the Silicon Glen, if you like. Um, and that lesson from huge uh, foreign direct investment uh, and going for the big bang, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to trying to develop stronger routes. Um, if you're going to go for the big bang, then you need to develop the supply chain so that it develops the routes into the local economies as well. And so you've not got um, a big shock uh, when somewhere, uh, somewhere large closes. Uh, and that opportunity uh, over the next few years, uh, in order to drive more stronger routes, that reconnection of people in place and giving people a sense of, uh, a, at least a sense of ownership mm -hmm. in, in the job they're doing, uh, is one which I think SCDI can play a, a big role in. Um, and, and help to drive those, those stronger connections uh, and, and, and disperse, disperse the shock, if you like, um, from any, any large-scale um, closures. Right, okay. Uh, I'm starting to see some questions coming in from the audience, so it would be good to, to move over to those. The yeah. first one's quite a long one, so I'll come back to that. I'll yeah. go to Ewing's question, which is how important do SCDI see tourism in the future economic growth of the country? Uh, uh, I think tourism is obviously a key aspect and, and we've got Ryder Cup and, and Commonwealth Games, uh, not to mention referendum, the, the elephant which will be dragged into the room at some point during this discussion. And clearly we need, we need to make the most of that, that world spotlight mm -hmm. being on Scotland and driving the tourism sector in that way. Um, but I think there's a, there's a mindset change in terms of the tourism sector which is happening mm -hmm. and, and perhaps needs a bit more support. Uh, going from it being you know, a, a, a nice thing to do, if you like, you know, and, and, and characterising the place as a nice place to be, to being much more active and, and business focused in terms of the opportunities for driving business through the tourism sector. I think government, um, Visit Scotland and others are getting that message, beginning to get that message over and beginning to 
use tourism as a main economic driver yeah. rather than it just being a, a nice thing because we're a nice place to visit. Right. Let's, the, the referendum had to come up at some stage, we knew it would. Let's go back to the first question that came in from Paul. It's quite, I'm going to read the whole question out because there's sure. a bit of background to it and I think it's better to make sure that I don't end up sort of slightly skewing his question. Um, he's part of an organisation that deals with the whole of the UK regarding CCT compliance. How can SCDI influence the reduction of the negative comments of what Scotland could not do if it was independent? His real concern is with the comments that he's heard down th south is that Scotland is being tarnished through a one-sided referendum debate and this bad mouthing will have a long-lasting effect for a possible future Scotland. Can SCDI influence this to reduce the negativity? Sorry. I think there are a couple of points um, to pick up on in that. I mean, first of all, I don't think anybody would suggest that the, the, the campaign has lit the imagination. Either campaign has lit the imagination thus far. Uh, we're beginning to see some um, maturity and some change in language mm -hmm. uh, and from both sides. Uh, and they're beginning to engage in a way which I think people will be able to, to get a hold of. But at the moment, they're... they're uh, they're going through the initial um, phases of the campaign and necessarily there is a lot of negativity around. I think as we turn the, turn the year round um, into spring um, and the campaigns get really underway, I think we'll see a lot more posit positive messages from both the campaigns because they will have to react to that desire from people to have more information. Um, and there's a place for SCDI and other organisations to lay out the common ground between the two campaigns, you kind of leave the, both campaigns aside for the moment and to lay out the common ground and the key characteristics of what a, a future Scottish economy could look like um, and then effectively to challenge both campaigns in terms of how they see their particular route developing and delivering on those characteristics. We've done some of that work in our previous Future Scotland series, we're going to be refreshing that over the next few months uh, and certainly we would, we would uh, expect uh, both the campaigns and both governments um, to sit up and take notice of the, uh, the, the views of our membership and our, and our wider family uh, in terms of how we see a future Scotland, what are those key characteristics of a Scottish economy, how do we avoid the shocks of Grangemouth and Govan, how do we develop the Scottish economy for future um, for future operation uh, and what are um, the elements uh, in terms of economic activity which we should be first, be, first and foremost be concentrating on um, and develop them as part of the argument. And what kind of concerns, just building on that, what kind of concerns have members, your membership been expressing in relation to you know, the whole, not just the outcome of the referendum yeah. but the whole referendum process and the impact that that might have on business? I think the lack of information is the big concern at the moment. Uh, we saw yesterday the, the full Scottish Cabinet out doing its first of a, a series of, of conversations with wider Civic Scotland. Um, and I think that was a good start uh, in terms of trying to get some of that and get into some of the detail, the nitty gritty, mm -hmm. um, and add to the, the 650 answers in the white paper. Um, you know, there will be many, many more questions mm. uh, than have been answered in that, in that document, as weighty as it may be. Um, and equally from the UK government's point of view and the Better Together campaign's point of view, then they need to start ans asking and answering some of those questions as well. So it's that lack of information at the moment. So we want to set some of those questions out. Mm -hmm. We want to provide some of the answers as our members see them in terms of the key characteristics. Uh, and then we want to challenge uh, both of the campaigns in terms of how they see themselves answering those and how they see their particular route taking us to that particular destination. But would it not be fair to say that a lot of those questions are almost unanswerable because we're moving into uncharted territory uh, and a lot of people you know, genuinely don't know what will happen when a decision is made? At the end of the day, the referendum is probably going to be more of an emotional decision for people. Well, I think that, that kind of takes on to the territory where most of our membership is, and that is that this is a debate for the here and now, and actually the more important debate is the longer term success of the, of the economy. Mm -hmm. And it has to be taken in that context. You know, it, it, 
it clearly is a hugely important moment in time uh, and, a, and an important decision for the country to take. But it's got to be seen in that broader context. So if you ask some of our, our global um, members um, about the, the referendum and their view of the referendum, then many of them will take the view that they operate in you know, 100 plus um, economies, they have different fiscal and regulatory regimes um, in which to deal with, they have different um, setups and cultures and characteristics, um, and this is one of a number of different changes which they have to deal with over time. And so the referendum has to be seen in that context um, across the medium and longer term as well as it being an important decision for just now. Okay, so I mean, sticking with that, because there's another question this time from Mike. Um, if Scotland keeps the pound following independence, what fiscal levers could be used to improve business growth in Scotland? I'm not so sure I want to get into um, speculation over whether whether we have the pound or the euro I, well, I, or the I, Scottish I, I mean, I think, I think what he's basically saying is if Scotland keeps the pound. Yeah. So he's not he's, he's making that as a, as a base assumption. Yeah. It's more what would we do if that was the case. Yeah. Um, Certainly from the Scottish perspective, um, if we keep, Im implied in his question is a yes in the referendum. Yeah. Um, and certainly from a Scottish perspective, then there needs to be stability uh, in terms of the economic order. Uh, and uh, the lessons to be learned from um, other countries who have gone through that change, you know, whether it's countries who have gone through um, the joining of the euro or whether it's countries who have gone down a different route, um, anywhere that's gone through that, that change in either monetary or fiscal policy uh, as a result of constitutional change, uh, there will be lessons to be learned. Um, but at the moment, uh, then you know, trying to dig down into some of those answers mm -hmm. is going to be, as you say yourself, Ian, it's going to be nigh on impossible until we get some more background right. from each of the campaigns in terms of you know, how they see the, the, the whole thing shaping up so that we can measure questions against, against their predictions and their projections uh, rather than speculating you know, in that broad canvas. Right, and I think that does kind of summarise it all. That is the difficulty of, yeah. of the information thing. Moving on, um, John has asked a question. This is around the kind of housing market, and he, he's mentioning specifically the fact that the UK government is trying to invigorate the economy mm. by stimulating the housing market through initiatives such as Help to Buy, yeah. but that risks a housing bubble as the southeast of the UK is, is seeing at the moment. How can Scotland distance itself from such a bubble, is John's question. Well, the housing market certainly needs um, incentive. Um, the shortage of housing uh, in Scotland is a major concern. Um, it creates a complete distortions in the housing market. It, it, it drives a, a, a wedge between um, rented sector and, and the purchased sector. And there needs to be some, um, some better balance in terms of the overall housing offer. And so certainly we need to have, we need to have growth, we need to release some of the, the housing sites which are sitting in the housing land supply. You know, and uh, many local plans, for example, um, have a major growth area sitting in the middle of them taking up those housing land supply numbers. And they were designed at a time of growth. And that was my, my point earlier about going from, and it's a shift of mentality, going from a period of growth to a period of restraint. Uh, and um, where you've got those large allocations um, sitting and not likely to come forward in the next few years, there needs to be a bit more sensitivity to the market. So, for example, in the Falkirk area where I live, mm -hmm. the local authority has introduced smaller sites um, which are much more likely to come forward in the current economic climate because the infrastructure investment, for example, uh, can be run in on the back of the small site rather than trying to go for a huge um, piece of infrastructure to service a a larger site, so hundreds of houses rather than thousands, okay. typically. Uh, and then you have different uh, mechanisms which the public sector are beginning to bring forward. So in Falkirk they have the, the tax, uh, tax increment finance programme which is going to sort out some of the bigger infrastructure and lead to, I think, uh, more likelihood of some of the bigger sites coming forward sooner than in some other areas. And so the, again it's that partnership between in this case, private sector, house building industry, public sector in terms of investment and in infrastructure, 
um, and not expecting one to do all and the other not, and bringing them together in order to create a stable framework and a stable operating base and making the most of the resources that we have. Okay, and I think, you know, we could explore that in a lot more depth, but we're getting a steady stream here, so I'm conscious of trying to deal with yeah. as many. So if we are skimming over some of the subjects, apologies for that, but I'd rather make sure we get to as many of the, yeah. the audience questions as we can. Um, Neil's asking, what do you think needs to be done to encourage entrepreneurs and enterprise to flourish in uh, Scotland? A, a, a okay. fine question. Um, Scotland has a... a, a a characteristic, a historic characteristic of being very entrepreneurial, and yet our SME um, um, birth and growth figures haven't, over the past you know, few decades, haven't been all they could have been. And so there is a real need for a more entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, and so we see things like the eSpark initiative mm -hmm. um, supporting um, entrepreneurial activity. And we need a lot more of that kind of thing. Uh, we see um, a, the, the development of um, a, a thing called intrapreneur, mm -hmm. taking entrepreneurial spirit into the heart of existing organisations. Um, and anything that SCDI can do to support that, that mentality, that attitude, that willingness to take risk, calculated risk, um, within or existing organisations as well as creating the conditions for the e-sparks of this world, uh, then that's surely something which is going to benefit in terms of developing the strength and resilience of the economy by making it more broad-based uh, and giving that particular ingredient a little, bit of a, a little bit of an incentive. Would it be fair to say that we could be doing more around in, within the education sector when it comes to, to enterprise and, and yeah. getting people to, I mean, what's your take on that? Well, we have 700, uh, SCDI organises 700 um, young engineers and science clubs um, in our schools. Um, and whenever you engage with our science clubs, our engineering clubs, then uh, you feel that entrepreneurial spirit in young people. Um, and one of the things that I'll certainly want to do, uh, particularly given my teaching background, um, is to ensure that that energy within those clubs is organised in a way that feeds through the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can and help those young people start thinking about um, an entrepreneurial direction uh, and an entrepreneurial mindset. There are a whole range of other initiatives beginning to flow from Curriculum for Excellence and the shift from you know, a straight subject-based um, teach-to mentality mm -hmm. to a much more engage young people to allow them to fulfil their own potential. Uh, and I think those things and a number of others will certainly help in terms of bringing education, employment uh, and those two streams together um, and put them at the heart of the education system. Are there other countries that seem to be getting this right uh, that we might be able to learn from? I, th I think if you look across um, either mainland Europe um, or over into Scandinavia um, or, or certainly in California and parts of the parts of the United States or over into the Far East, I mean there are countries the world over where there are pockets of entrepreneurial spark and brilliance mm -hmm. um, and certainly we want to try and take some elements from some of them but bearing in mind that the cultures in many of these places are different from ours and so you can't just transpose an idea from one country directly to another but if we can if we can harness that spirit yeah. which is clearly in in many young minds um, and not you know beat it out of them intellectually with a with a, a focus on subject specialisms and you must do these exams at these times, yeah. uh, then we need to allow that to flourish. And if we can do that, then I think the education system and young people in particular would benefit hugely. Okay, um, got a question from Alistair here, um, and this one's about the financial sector's role uh, in the support for SMEs. He's saying it's critical, but the main bank's perspective on business startups and SMEs is that they're high risk. And he's gone on to say that in the Highlands, businesses of this type account for up to 40% of employment opportunities. How can we overcome these problems? How can we get, get past this high risk perspective mm -hmm. from financial institutions? 
I think the, the, the banks and the main banks themselves have recognised coming out of um, the, the really difficult and challenging period which they've faced um, following the crash. They've recognised that they need to realign themselves in terms of how they support um, small business. But we're also seeing the growth of different types of banks. You know, we have the Green Investment Bank, we have the growth of uh, more localised banks. We have some proposals by um, ac across the political spectrum in terms of regional banking. They're beginning to be a lot more imagination uh, driven into the system. Uh, and I think as we, as we go through the next few years, both with the, the main banks realigning themselves and with other players entering the market, then we're much more likely to see people willing to take more calculated risk uh, and be able to reflect the diversity mm -hmm. of the economy uh, with diversity in terms of the sector. Are you seeing any evidence from, from your membership that things are that, that's beginning to happen and that things are beginning to filter through and become a yeah, easier? Yeah, absolutely. There are a whole range of different funding and financing mechanisms out there. Um, everything from from crowdfunding at one mm. end of the spectrum through to a bit more imagination and, and, and willingness um, of institutions that have been through a really challenging time mm. and understandably not willing to, to take some of the risks that they might have, have taken in the past. Um, so all across that spectrum, we're beginning to see where small businesses are being able to find funding um, and be able to um, develop uh, themselves in a way that might not have been possible, say, five or ten years ago. And the public sector has a, has a big role uh, to play in, in this field as well. And, and we're beginning to see, for example, a bit more imagination around the use of public sector pension funds mm -hmm. and how you can challenge and, and channel um, those massive um, amounts of capital back into the system to create the conditions for the public sector itself to operate in and to make its life easier in terms of the, the services which it's trying to deliver. Okay, we'll move on from the financial sector, but it kinda, you mentioned the environment there, so this next question kind of touches on that. Uh, how can Scotland use its environment to best advantage? What areas could Scotland lead on in a low carbon future? Uh, Scotland clearly has um, a, a magnificent story to tell in terms of the natural environment. Uh, we have a huge amount of resource, whether that's onshore or offshore, uh, and the ability to harness both the, the physical nature of the environment um, and then characterise that in terms of the kind of country we want to be. So, you know, regardless of the result of the referendum, then I think there, was a, there, there is probably a broad majority, a fairly sizable majority of the country who would be rightly proud of mm -hmm. the kind of natural place which Scotland is. And if we can uh, reflect that in terms of the places we create, uh, in terms of the buildings we design, in terms of the building control regulations, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of how we link renewables to our daily needs. Um, and we're beginning to see some of those aspects come forward. Um, so, for example, um, SCDI supports the Cities Alliance mm -hmm. across the country um, and we have a number of demonstrator projects uh, underway with Aberdeen uh, leading on hydrogen technology and, and the use of hydrogen in public transport, for example. Uh, so we're beginning to make those links of environment and economy and getting the balance between environment and economy right mm -hmm. rather than seeing them as two competing interests uh, to their own mutual disadvantage. So where we can make that happen, then clearly there's a role for us and others um, to drive that agenda forward. So again, for the benefit of anyone listening, hearing that phrase, demonstrator projects, I think that's, that's what you refer mm -hmm. to. How do they work? What, what's that all about? The, the, the Cities Alliance is a, um, a partnership between Scotland's seven cities mm -hmm. and Scottish Government uh, and its own and its other agencies. Um, and it's come together to develop some aspects of urban policy and, and also to develop particular demonstrations where you can take policy into practice. And, and so the demonstrator projects, um, which are funded through 
um, through the alliance and the government grant. The government have put up £7 million pounds, um, to get some of them um, off the ground. And so we're beginning to see the, the benefits of them coming forward. Uh, and if people need uh, more information on the Cities Alliance, then you can get that through through SCDI on our website. OK, and we'll be putting up contact details at the end for that anyway. Um, another question from Eric, and it's going back to you. You mentioned the engineers and the, the schools yeah. project. Uh, are the young engineers promoting a better gender balance? Are there more females considered that, engineers? That is a challenge, um, although uh, within our clubs, um, it, we are beginning to see um, many more uh, young young girls coming forward um, to take part, but there is a there is a real challenge there in terms of perception, in terms of uh, parental attitude um, to what's an appropriate uh, career for a, a, a young boy or an appropriate career for a young girl to start thinking about. So, you know, we absolutely need to challenge that particular aspect uh, and ensure that, uh, like you know, most other modern economies then you know, the gender issue um, uh, is, uh, is removed in the sense of it just becomes a natural part and parcel and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what people's attitudes in the past have been, uh, these opportunities should be open for everybody. Right, okay. Well, I think, you know, it, coming back on to the, one of the things that I think I've been looking at on your website here, which was, I think it's important that we talk about this, the Blueprint 2015, mm. I think you're having a consultation kind of exercise next year. Three of the things that you focus on there are innovation, infrastructure and skills. Can mm. you tell me a bit more about what that exercise is all about? Yeah, and, and, and if I can um, describe it in terms of the work which one of our cities is doing, um, and which SCDI would wholly support uh, and it gives an idea of the kind of the link between policy and practice that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so in Glasgow, um, which has uh, attracted funding from a range of different sources um, and is beginning to look, for example, at a, a new city deal mm -hmm. uh, with the UK government, then they're taking uh, the opportunity to bring together, to gather round the civic um, political leadership of the of the city to gather around them a whole range of different expertise from across public, private and social economy sectors in order to drive all of those issues. So they're, begin, they're beginning to be much more innovative in terms of how they, uh, how they deal with some of the um, difficult challenges which that city has faced. Um, so for example, linking economy and welfare um, together. Mm -hmm. now, you're not going to solve um, the, the, the local economic uh, situation uh, and drive that forward in, unless you can solve you know, the welfare side of the equation. And so where in the past we've had either post or pre-devolution, um, in both cases we've had a split of function between different bits of government whether it's UK government or Scottish government or local government or other parts of the public sector, then being able to bring them all together, all at the table at the same time, then will enable us to drive all, all those three characteristics. Um, and so that work is beginning to, to be done, um, not just in Glasgow, obviously, but, but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but the ability um, to drive innovation, for example, through the system um, is now is now there and we have a, a chance and an opportunity which I don't think we've had in the past. The other, I mean, you mentioned the, the innovation is one of the aspects, infrastructure is yep. one of the others. Yep. What do you think needs to be done around infrastructure to, to move us forward? Well, we mentioned infrastructure in terms of Falkirk and the yeah, TIF earlier, yeah. Glasgow and, and their project um, around Edinburgh and the city, the city region around Edinburgh. Um, the whole of that area, uh, whether it's uh, the city itself, or whether it's East Lothian, Middle Lothian, West Lothian, Borders or Fife, they're all now focused on developing economic infrastructure and, and avoiding the mistakes of the past. Mm. Um, so, for example, um, when Edinburgh uh, City um, embarked upon its congestion charging uh, referendum, then the ground wasn't really prepared properly in the whole wider travel to work area you know, the area of impact of that particular decision. So that is now coming together 
and everybody responsible across that wider area are starting to talk about, well, how do we do these things in the future? How do we avoid you know, trading one area off against another? How do we do it in partnership to cover the whole area of the impact of a decision? Uh, and other areas of the country, similarly so, are starting to look at those, those items as well. Okay. We're getting very close to the end here. Um, there's not too much time left. It's, it's flown past and we could probably sit and chat for another few hours, but people will have jobs to go to, I'm sure. Um, if we look post-referendum, whatever the result after the referendum, how do you see that affecting SCDI's role? So let's take it, if, if it's a yes vote and, mm -hmm. and the country becomes independent, yep. how is that likely to affect SCDI as a first one? Either way, whether it's a yes right. or a no, um, SCDI needs to maintain its Scotland-wide focus. Um, so if we look at, for example, the work which the three island authorities have been doing um, and all their partners um, in, in Sh across Shetland, Orkney and across the Western Isles, they're driving a really hard bargain in terms of the outcome of the referendum, mm -hmm. whether it's a yes or a no. Uh, and certainly we are beginning to see other places um, around Scotland starting to find voice. Um, SCDI's raison d'etre is to give voice to the communities around the country and across the public sector, the private sector and the social economy. And so our role, whichever result um, uh, we wake up to on September the 19th um, next year, our role will continue to be to develop the strength of that voice across the country to identify the key aspects, the aspirations, the aims of people in different parts of the country, in different sectors across the country, all with a view to ensuring that Scotland's economy is stronger, that it's more resilient, that it's more robust, and it can withstand any shocks, whether it's an electoral shock, a fiscal shock, or a, a, a shock not of our making from somewhere else in the global economy. Uh, that will continue to be uh, our resolve um, and that's the work which I'm certainly going to be engaged in over the next few months. Just to, uh, just to just begin to wrap up, uh, at a personal level you've been in the job relatively, a relatively right. short period of time, have there been any things over the last couple of weeks, months that you've thought, goodness that's a real surprise, what are the, th what are the things that have shocked you? In I a good way or a bad way, it doesn't there's matter. There's nothing really that's shocked uh -huh. but, but maybe surprised. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a real hunger out there for, for people to have a vehicle by which they can engage. Uh, whether that's engaging with uh, policy makers or whether that's engaging with other people in their sector or whether that's engaging with peop not, you know, people they wouldn't traditionally see as partners. And the, the surprise, I suppose, is that after years of you know, real difficult circumstances for most organisations and, and companies around the country. The spirit of Scotland is still really well and truly alive. People want to engage. They want to be part of creating whatever a future Scotland might look like. And so when we see um, uh, commentators uh, suggesting that you know, it's all doom and gloom and it's too difficult and, you know, and, and the country's going to be divided, then actually I think there's a unity of purpose and sense of, of belief that we can indeed strengthen the Scottish economy and make everybody's lives that little bit easier um, and that little bit more enjoyable. So looking forward, looking ahead a year, leaving aside the, the referendum mm. uh, issue, uh, if you're looking back on the past 12 months as it will be at that stage, if there was one thing that you could have had an impact on that you, you know, would be the highlight for you, what would that be? What would you like to change? Just generally speaking. We probably should keep it on a business level, but you know, maybe, maybe we'll get another <laughs> insight as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, the one thing um, that I would have liked to see different um, is the ability of people at the local level to be more confident in their own self and in their own ability. Um, we need people to challenge the status quo and to challenge their own um, operating environment um, and not just to accept that 
it's I been. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we can if we can have that challenge, then that will drive innovation and change through the system where it's required. Um, and a wee bit more, you know, a bit more pilots out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we pilot lights um, being lit around the country uh, would certainly make everybody's life um, a bit easier uh, in terms of trying to drive change through the system. So it's just lighting these little fires. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have run out of time. That's 45 minutes, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. It's been great having this chat with you um, and hopefully for our audience. That will give you a bit of an insight into where Ross is looking to go with SCDI and what he's trying to do. Um, if you do want to get in touch with them, their contact details will be in the discussion box on the right hand side of the video window any minute now or it may already be there. If it isn't, it will be with you very shortly. It just remains for me to say thank you very much for joining us. It's been great having you with us and we've had a fantastic array of questions there. I uh, hope you all have a great time over the festive season and come back in 2014 ready and rearing to go. Thanks very much.